It's going to be great. We are going to rebuild the temple. Yes, this is the same temple that Solomon built. The same place where God's presence was visible among his people. I, I don't remember what it looked like, but my grandpa told me. You see, he told me that people actually came to worship God every day. Now, you might be wondering, why don't I know this? Well, I wasn't born yet. I was actually born in Babylon. I don't remember anything of the old temple. I don't remember Israel. I've never seen it before, but I'm going there for the first time in my life. And it's going to be amazing. Now, you might be saying, why was I born in Babylon? Well, that's a good question. The problem was that even though people could go to worship God every day, they didn't. A lot of people worshipped false gods, idols. Some people just didn't care. They, they didn't care about God at all. And instead of letting God's people go to hell in unbelief, God didn't allow that. He sent them into Babylon to wake them up. And boy, are we ever awake. You see, my name is Joshua. My family and I are going back to the promised land because in the year 536 B.C., Cyrus, king of Persia, authorized a group of us to go back and start to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. There will be more that follow, but I'm in that first group. And there's a man with us. He's a priest. His name is Zechariah. He leads us in worship of the true God, and yet he's more than a priest. He's also one of God's prophets. God speaks through him. Today, I want you to hear some of his words. They're recorded for you in your worship folder. Here are these words. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire, and I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Dear Christian friends, I'm not Joshua. This is Pastor Fred speaking. But I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to our text. A little bit of background as to the people to whom Zechariah was speaking. The people who were walking back to rebuild the temple were excited. They were wide awake and they knew God's plan for them. And yet, they became apathetic so quickly. You see, when they arrived at Israel, building the temple, rebuilding Jerusalem didn't go as planned. There was one setback after another. There were enemies waiting for them when they got there. And the people soon started to despair and almost gave up. And yet the prophet Zechariah wrote these words to give the people hope. To help them understand God's plan for their life. And so even though these words were written some 500 years before Jesus walked the earth, and even though we live some 2,000 years after Jesus walks the earth, these words still have meaning for our lives. Let's see what they say. Jump into the first verse, verse 7 with me again. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. These words are a little confusing. God has spoken, even in this book, about false shepherds and what He will do with them. And He will punish them and remove them from His people. And yet, this is not a false shepherd. This is my shepherd. This is none other than Jesus. He speaks about this in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. But now you might be asking, why on earth would God strike the shepherd? Why would He raise His sword? Well, if you listen to the second half of the verse, he says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hands against the little one. Now this doesn't really help us, and yet Jesus quotes these exact words. He applies them to himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the night that he was betrayed, he said, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. 
All right, we know what this means, but this doesn't necessarily answer why. Why would God allow this to happen? Well, we could speculate and be like an internet news service, or we could go into God's Word. Because anytime you don't understand one portion of Scripture, like the prophet Zechariah, you can go back and look somewhere else. Is there anywhere else where God talks about this? And He does. In Isaiah chapter 53, He uses the exact same word. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Strike the shepherd. That word strike, you may have sung it in a hymn, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Listen to how Isaiah says this. We consider him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Yes, Isaiah talks about the shepherd being struck also. But he gives more of a reason why. He says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. By His wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. When the prophet Zechariah said, Awake, O sword, that sword was the cross. That was the Roman soldiers. That was how Jesus died. Now you might be saying, why did God have to die? Well, He died for us, of course, and it's not necessarily a happy thought that God had to die for us. What exactly did He save us from? Well, He saved us from sin. I want to give you an example. If you go back to the storms that have ravaged the Midwest, especially Oklahoma, you go back to more Oklahoma, and one of the tornadoes that destroyed thousands and thousands of homes hit a school. And there were children in that school. And for Karen Marinelli, that meant that there were three students in her third grade class who were left. And the roof was ripped off and a brick wall was falling and she jumped on top of those students. And the brick wall fell on her and broke bones in her back and her spine. She needs to undergo months of rehabilitation. She'll probably recover completely and yet that was quite a sacrifice. She's being called a hero, and she is. And yet when God died, when Jesus took the cross, when He was struck down by the sword, that sword was raised to fall on us. You see, God raised that sword to punish us for our sins, and yet it fell on our Savior, the Good Shepherd Jesus. Now you might say, what sin might we have and, well, you can take your pick. There's so many. And yet, I think the greatest sin that we have is often the one that the Israelites have. It's apathy. I know all of you are here this morning. God be praised that you've come to gather around His Word. The Spirit has moved you to do so. And yet, every day we can check our hearts to see, is there something creeping into my life that ought not be there? But I want to focus a little bit more you see, Zechariah went on, and his topic was one about cross-bearing. That's what our Gospel lesson is about. God calls us to take up our cross. What exactly does that look like? Well, listen to verse 8. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds we struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. There are a lot of people in this world that don't know who Jesus is. That's obvious. In fact, Jesus says this. He says, times will get worse, not better. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few will find it. Yeah, life is bad. And it can be difficult to find Jesus. And yet, for those of us who have been gathered around God's Word, what does that mean? What does that mean for the one-third of us? Zechariah says, This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. Now you might say, fire? Um, God, I'm precious enough already, really. Trust me. I don't need any more refining. That's not on my radar screen as a Christian. And yet God still brings us into that fire. And if you think of it as cross-bearing, what does that mean? Well, that cross is anything in your life that would tempt you 
to hate God, tempt you to forsake your faith, tempt you to leave God. So, what does that look like specifically? Well, that could be maybe the common cold. It's okay to have the common cold, but as soon as you start to question God's love for your life, that turns into a cross. How does God help us with our cross-bearing? God did not leave His scattered flock. He gathered them. There was that one-third that He gathered in mercy, and He does not leave us alone. And He helps us. He brings us into that fire to help us, too. Well, how does He help us? There's three ways. The first way is that when we have a cross, He might take away that cross. You see that with the common cold, with instances in our life that are hard and yet they pass. That's pretty easy to see. The common cold goes away in less than a week. Car repairs, well, they can be paid for. And yet, what happens when there's a problem that we can't get rid of? What happens if it's a chronic illness? What happens if it's financial trouble that dog us constantly? Well, maybe he'll give us the strength to bear up under it. Yes, sometimes he leaves that cross on us, and yet, remember, crosses always bring us closer to him And so any opportunity that we have to go to Him for help, to fully rely on Him, is a blessing. He doesn't say that it's going to be fun. But when we bear that cross, it can be a very good thing for the Christian. He'll remove the cross. Maybe He'll give us the strength to bear up under the cross if He doesn't remove it. And finally, there's a third way. Sometimes He removes us from the cross. What does that mean? Well, that means that sometimes He takes us out of this world. Maybe there's a terminal illness that we've been struggling with. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe there's someone in our life that we know that we've been praying for. Lord, please take their cross away. Ease their burden. Remove their pain. And God does that. Now, that might not seem like a good answer, and yet finally, is there anything better than removing us from all the struggles, to take us home to be with Him forever, that is the Christian's final goal and joy. Listen to the last verse of our text. They will call on My name and I will answer them. I will say they are My people and they will say the Lord is our God. That is the final goal of all crosses that we bear. That's how we are refined to be pure silver, to be pure gold. So that we discard any doubt so that we face every test fully relying on our God so that nothing will stop us. I can't wait! It's going to be so great when we get there to worship God in our temple. We'll see Him. I'm not talking as Joshua. This is still Pastor Fred speaking. I'm just thinking about heaven and how great it will be for one day to see Jesus face to face, to worship God, without any crosses, without any temptation, because we will be pure. Dear friends, that's the day when we will say, the Lord is our God. And He will say to us, these are My people. Amen. Please stand.